Wittekind, the Saxon Patriot. As Germany in its wars with the Romans found its hero in the great Arminius or Hermann, and as England in its contest with the Normans found a heroic defender in the valiant Heroward, so Saxony in its struggles with Charlemagne gave origin to a great soul, the indomitable patriot Wittekind, who kept the war afoot years after the Saxons would have yielded to their mighty foe, and, like Heroward, only gave up the struggle when hope itself was at an end. The career of the defender of Saxony bears some analogy to that of the last patriot of Saxon England. As in the case of Heroward, his origin is uncertain, and the story of his life overlaid with legend. He is said to have been the son of Wernikind, a powerful Westphalian chief, brother-in-law of Siegfried, a king of the Danes. Yet this is by no means certain, and his ancestry must remain in doubt. He came suddenly into the war with the great Frank conqueror, and played in it a strikingly prominent part, to sink again out of sight at its end. The attempt of Charlemagne to conquer Saxony began in 772. Religion was its pretext, ambition its real cause. Missionaries had been sent to the Saxons during their great national festival at Marclo. They came back with no converts to report, as the Saxon had refused to be converted by words fire and sword were next tried as assumed instruments for spreading the doctrines of christ but really as effective means for extending the dominion of the monarch of the franks in his first campaign in saxony charlemagne marched victoriously as far as the Weser, where he destroyed the celebrated irminsul a famous object of saxon devotion perhaps an image of a god perhaps a statue of Hermann that had become invested with divinity the next year Charles being absent in Italy, the Saxons broke into insurrection, under the leadership of Wittekind, who now first appears in history. With him was associated another patriot, Alboin, Duke of Eastphalia. Charles returned in the succeeding year, and again swept in conquering force through the country. But a new insurrection called him once more to Italy, and no sooner had he gone than the eloquent Wittekind was among his countrymen, entreating them to rise in defense of their liberties. A general levy took place, every able man crowded to the ranks, and whole forests were felled to form abatis of defense against a marching enemy. Again Charles came at the head of his army of veterans, and again the poorly trained Saxon levies were driven in defeat from his front. He now established a camp in the heart of the country, and had a royal residence built at Paderborn, where he held a diet of the great vassals of the crown, and received envoys from foreign lands. Hither came delegates from the humbled Saxons, promising peace and submission, and pledging themselves by oaths and hostages to be true subjects of Charles the Great. But Wittekind came not. He had taken refuge at the court of Siegfried, the pagan king of the New Danes, where he waited an opportunity to strike a new blow for liberty. Not content with their pledges and promises, the conqueror sought to win over his new subjects by converting them to Christianity in the wholesale way in which this work was then usually performed. The Saxons were baptized in large numbers, the proselyting method pursued being, as we are told, that all prisoners of war must be baptized, while of the others all who were reasonable would be baptized, and the inveterately unreasonable might be bribed to be baptized. Doubtless, as a historian remarks, the Saxons found baptism a cool, cleanly and agreeable ceremony while their immersion in the water had little effect in washing out their old ideas and washing in new ones the exigencies of war in his vast empire now called charlemagne to spain where the arabs had become troublesome and needed chastisement not far had he marched away when wittekind was again in saxony passing from tribe to tribe through the forests of the land and with fiery eloquence calling upon his countrymen to rise against the invaders and regain the freedom of which they had been deprived heedless of their conversion disregarding their oaths of allegiance filled with the free spirit which had so long inspired them the chiefs and people listened with approval to his burning words seized their arms and flew again to war the priests were expelled from the country, the churches they had built demolished, the castles erected by the Frank monarch taken and destroyed, and the country was laid waste up to the walls of Cologne, its Christian inhabitants being exterminated. But unyielding as Wittekind was, his great antagonist was equally resolute and persistent. When he had finished his work with the Arabs, he returned to Saxony with his whole army, fought a battle in 779 in the dry bed of the Eder, and in 780, 
defeated Wittekind and his followers in two great battles, completely disorganizing and discouraging the Saxon bands, and again bringing the whole country under his control. This accomplished, he stationed himself in their country, built numerous fortresses upon the Elbe, and spent the summer of 780 in missionary work, gaining a multitude of converts among the seemingly subdued barbarians. The better to make them content with his rule, he treated them with great kindness and affability and sent among them missionaries of their own race, being the hostages whom he had taken in previous years, and who had been educated in monasteries. All went well. The Saxons were to all appearance in a state of peaceful satisfaction, and Charles felicitated himself that he had finally added Saxony to his empire. He deceived himself sadly. He did not know the spirit of the free-born Saxons, or the unyielding perseverance of their patriotic leader. In the silent depths of their forests, and in the name of their ancient gods, they vowed destruction to the invading Franks, and branded as traitors all those who profess Christianity, except as a stratagem to deceive their powerful enemy. Entertaining no suspicion of the true state of affairs, Charlemagne at length left the country, which he fancied to be fully pacified, and its people content. With complete confidence in his new subjects, he commissioned his generals, Giel and Adalgis, to march upon the Slavonians beyond the Elbe, who were threatening France with a new barbarian invasion. They soon learned that there was other work to do. In a brief time, the irrepressible Wittekind was in the field again, with a new levy of Saxons at his back, and the tranquillity of the land, established at such pains, was once more in peril. Theodoric, one of Charlemagne's principal generals, hastily marched towards them with what men he could raise, and on his way met the army sent to repel the Slavonians. They approached the Saxon host where it lay encamped on the Weser, behind the Sundell Mountain, and laid plans to attack it on both sides at once. But jealousy ruined these plans, as it has many other well-laid schemes. The leaders of the Slavonian contingent, eager to rob Theodoric of glory, marched in haste on the Saxons, attacked them in their camp, and were so completely defeated and overthrown that but a moiety of their army escaped from the field. The appearance of these fugitives in the camp of Theodoric was the first he knew of the treachery of his fellow generals and their signal punishment. The story of this dreadful event was in all haste borne to Charlemagne. His army had been destroyed almost as completely as that of Varus on a former occasion, and in nearly the same country. The distressing tidings filled his soul with rage and a bitter thirst for revenge. He had done his utmost 